Welcome to West of Tulsa. I'm C.J. Ward. We are broadcasting from our studio, Studio 3 in Ventura, California. Let's look at the team. we got Beth Farnsworth Ward, my Hello. beautiful wife. Nice yeah. to be here. Welcome back. Gabe, Shore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you're getting better. All right. Getting better. <laughs> Helm Still Seacat. There. Good to see you guys. And the man behind the controls, Dan Brockett. He's actually the man in charge, since he has the controls. Damn bro. Brockett. He has this thing about Brockett. Brockett. Sure. Huh? Like, like a big <laughs> belch. That's right. a bro or, or a fart. All right. <laughs> and our guest today, on that note, Steve Feist is joining us. Now, I asked Steve, so how do I introduce you? And he goes, I don't know. You're overthinking it. But if I say Steve Feist, hot rodder, old school hot rodder from Ventura County, is that pretty close? Close as you can get. Would you change it? We, what would you add to it? Dirt bag. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you tell their friends? See, see, Gabe's got it closer than you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So there you go. So now I, I've met him once, and I, I would say I would add badass. Can I say that? There you go, uh, badass. In a good, you go. In a good oh, way. what's with the compliments already? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> really, All right, really trying to get out your good this. side. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us today. West of Tulsa. Yeah. Guest number two. Wow. So, and and we just should say, Steve has a really nice collection of cars. Some of it was his grandfather's, and he's, his warehouse is not far from west of Tulsa. So he's a neighbor. Yes. So thanks for coming down here and talking about just your history, your grandfather, your stories. And you've got some cool cars, so we're going to get into that in a second as well. Uh, talk about how did you get into this? How did you get into this whole world of classic cars and hot rodding and fixing them all up? and uh, the story is long, but uh, short as I can make it. Just kind of grew up in it. My dad was into it, and that's where it really started from, my dad. And then basically, you know, the drill. You go down with dad's shop in the summers, and that's what you did. And Just it's wrench like, and work on stuff. More like push a broom. and oh, okay. <laughs> you had to work your way up. The, yeah, the system, that's, okay. why, that's why my favorite line is you got to – Push the broom before you can work on the car. Yeah, we you met know? your son. He's probably doing that. Is he in that stage, or has he gone past he, it? Yeah, no, I still got to get him perfecting the whole broom and dust bound thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, yeah, good. he's uh, but he's he's doing good. He's I can turn him loose. He's kind of <laughs> learning how to use an impact and stuff. So I can turn him loose. He can jack the car up. I haven't quite figured out the jack stand position, but, you know, he's getting there. All right. So little by little. So your dad kind of got you into it. Yeah. And then, and your grandfather? My grandfather was heavy diesel equipment mechanic slash marine industry, heavily in the marine industry. Well known in this area, right? Very well known. Yeah. Um, Did a lot of things, wore a lot of hats, just really, really great guy. And my dad was a good guy too, very well known and in the automotive industry and everybody liked him too. Very likable guy. And um but he was he was into the, the hot rods. My grandpa was into the cars, but he didn't really come into it as far as like he was always into them, but he didn't start collecting them until I'm gonna say somewhere in the seventies is when he kind of started grabbing some more cars and stuff and then the collection started from there with him. And you were at the right age. In the 70s, you would have been right in that, hey, I'm going to be driving soon, and I can <laughs> drive some of these fun cars. Is that is that Did that help inspire you in any way? I kind of didn't realize it was happening, but it was happening. Yeah. I was more wanting to go screw around and try to build go-karts. And, you know, I was surfing and skateboarding and all of that. I was doing anything I could to have fun. You know, and then, like I said, then summers would come along, let's go to Dash, like, damn it. And I'd rather be at <laughs> home have, hanging out with my buddies and riding bikes and raising hell. So but, um, what was your, your dad's name and grandfather's name? Uh, dad's name was Dave Feist. Um, grandfather's name was Jim Johnston. Got it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Big following here in this area because of his connection to the Marine world. Yeah, my grandfather yeah. for sure. Yeah, A lot yeah, of people right. in this town know who Jim Johnston was yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So his collection, um, when he passed, you inherited the collection. And so you've got a big chunk of it now. I kind of inherited it. Okay. It was one of those things to where it wasn't a very pretty transition. Let's oh, put okay. it that way. And I purchased the collection. Oh, got it. So, okay. Okay. Which I look back and go, maybe I should have just stuck with my own collection. But, but, but it's, here we are. It's impressive, though. I've seen it. <laughs> There's got to be an emotional component to this, and that's why you did what you did. Yeah. You know, you're 100% right. Um, 
there was obviously, you know, my grandpa was so passionate about the cars. He was obviously an eclectic car collector. So he collected all kinds of stuff that I really had zero interest. I mean, I could appreciate him, their cars and stuff, but they just weren't my, they weren't my cup of tea. And, uh, but it was all good. He kind of did his thing. I did my thing. Um, when he passed, the reason I, you know, my grandmother was still alive. So, and she wanted to keep the cars in. That's what she wanted to do. I kind of wanted to sell some off and thin the herd a little bit. Um, but she wanted to keep them all. And I thought, well, I have a shop. He has a shop. So what I'll do is I will do one shop up real awesome and do it like in honor of him mm -hmm. and do it like his style cars. Mm -hmm. And I'll do my shop and do it my style <laughs> cars. And then, of course, over the years, I've realized that there's only one of me. It's not going to happen. Sure. So, um, though that's, I might be getting ahead of the story here, but the bottom line is that's why I'm in the process of starting to liquidate my grandma, my grandfather's cars, because I'm, I just can't do them all. I mean, there's no way. I mean, if I worked on them every single minute for the rest of my life, um, they wouldn't all get done. Well, I knew how many, I, I was impressed just by looking through his files, how many he had. Yeah. You probably pretty, know more about what's going pretty on. Incre files yeah. <laughs> pretty impressive. Yeah. Those Bantams are, they have a following. Yeah. So, yeah, no, there's a, you can't imagine how many people that knew my all over the United States. It isn't just here, no. but all over the United States, I got people calling. I still have like three or four guys calling me, hounding me for a couple of the cars. Uh, they know I'm like, got. yeah, when yeah. I get about, five or six of you guys lined up then because as you know they're up on a mezzanine right. so it's you know it's a three-day process just to get the cars down uh -huh. so, anyway. well it's yeah it's impressive uh and then the hot rotting um well uh, no, i'm gonna ask you steve I, I don't think i've ever asked you this but um would you consider yourself more of a collector or a rotter oh there you go that's a good question um <laughs> a fool we'll start there <laughs> <laughs> um because yeah, I I like it both. I like them both. It's cool to have them. Like I like both ends of the spectrum. It's cool to go out and you know stand on the gas on something that's got a bunch of power behind it, and um, you know and basically harness harness the power and be able to drive a car that a lot of people wouldn't be able to drive because you know they're squirrely and mm -hmm. out of hand and stuff. So that's kind of the fun for me. It's the adrenaline pump and being able just to to master it and um so i like that part of it but i also like you know you come in and you see these cars and it's just something that's and it's not to like say hey look what i got it's it's like you come in and it's your you're stoked for yourself you're like man that's mm -hmm. those are badass mm -hmm. like um you know i just recently um because i'm talking to gabe so i just recently bought a car back for the third time oh, okay? oh wow. so, <laughs> and it was a car that i bought and then i wanted to fix it all up gabe bought it from me which car is which car? Uh, 66 Nova. The one I should have oh. never sold. Yeah. No. Oh. And, and so then he had bigger and better things to go on to. So I bought the car back. Um, and then another good friend of mine, he purchased it from me. And then he was, you know, and this guy builds super, super high end cars. I mean, extremely high end cars. And um, so this thing would have had at least a couple hundred thousand thrown at it for sure. And um, he just, he's got so many, he's got five cars being redone in the, in a shop out in Valencia at this moment. Wow. And he's like, nah, I, I'm, I'm going a different direction. I'm going to sell it. So I bought it back. So, <laughs> um, so Did this happen recently? Because I know you were thinking about it, but then you, you were asking I, me if I wanted to do it. And then. You know I bought it back. I wow. thought I told you. I'm just trying to be nice here. Is this, the one you, is this the one you bought a few months ago? Um, yeah. Three, four so. months. You did tell me that story. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's cool. But it's impressive. But kind of going back to where we started, that car right now, it's like I still walk in. Since I purchased it back, I walk in the shop and I always focus on that car. Oh. And I realize, you know, hmm. I just dig that car because Gabe bought it and then was having me build the car. Mm -hmm. So as obviously I learned a lot more about the car when I was working on it for Gabe, but, and you know, of course, you grow kind of more of a fondness to it. And you're just like, wow, you know, yeah. this is a bitching car. It's yeah. not, it's, it ha nope, not a hundred people have worked on it and thrashed it. And so it's kind of a, a virgin car, so to speak. It hasn't been through a bunch of hands. And mm -hmm. 
that's kind of what I like. I like finding cars that even if they've got some bad things to them, if they just haven't been touched by a million people, they're cool. There's oh, a purity wow. that remains, yeah. isn't there? Is there an unspoken first right of refusal when something like this happens? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. It depends. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it depends on case by case and depends on the person. Because there's some guys who are like, you ain't never going to own that car again kind of thing. Which Helm has experienced. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. Which is a sad yeah. thing. But like, exactly. exactly. But you know what, though? The thing is, is that <clears throat> when I got the car from Steve, I had these dreams of grandeur of turning it into a super fast ride. I, I didn't care about the heritage. Like, I didn't care about how original it was. I didn't care about all those things until I met Steve. You know, and I meet I meet Steve. Where I'm working on the car. He's working on the car for me. He made the suggestions for your fault, by the way, <laughs> because I was going to have some other shop working. I think I didn't. He saved me from that. But he's putting it together, and he's like, because I'm like, oh, I want to put an LS engine in. I want to do, 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 do all this stuff. And he's like, what about a small, you know, motor, a small, a uh, small block Chevy or whatever? I'm like, ah, that's for old farts or whatever. And then, he's, and then he's showing me like all the cool things that you could do. We went to a bunch of shows. He taught me a bunch of stuff. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. So I'm like, okay, now I'm like. Now I'm getting attached to how original the car was, how in good condition it was, and it had zero rust on it, which is like oh, almost impossible, huge. Yeah. right? Oh. So then I'm like, well, maybe I shouldn't do all this dumb stuff to it. After we were like, I mean, had tens of thousands of dollars into like custom front end, and the engine that he built was like, I mean, perfect. every single bolt is an ARP bolt, and anybody who knows about ARP bolts knows how expensive that could be. And now it's like this beautiful piece that like, I don't know if I'd want to even drive it. It's so nice, <laughs> you know. You'd kind be of afraid thing. to, right? Yeah, because yeah, in yeah. Steve's collection, you know, he's got cars that I was just like, I don't even want to like breathe on them because like they're so nice, and not because they're original, but because they've been have so much time and money yeah. put into it, you know. So it's like that thing with Helm. Helm's like all about keeping it original and classic. That's why I asked Steve, "Are you a collector or a rider?" Because I'm not a collect. I don't want to collect cars that I'm afraid to drive. I want to drive everything and blow the engine up and spin the tires and do all kinds of stuff. So, and I don't want to ruin anything that could be a collector's car or something that kept original. So I, I respect that. You know, it's just that's not my cup of tea. It's like you know, and but you know, see, like you said, you're a hybrid of the two, right? You have both. Yep. You know, in your collection. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah you, you respect a car that you look at it and know the history of it, respect the history of it. Moving forward, even have after. Oh, it's absolutely. like, what am I going to do with this thing? It, what comes, what it boils down to is the history of that car. Hundred percent. Yeah. Like if I purchase a car or something from somebody, or you know, we're going through paperwork or files or something, like, oh, you probably wouldn't want this. I'm like, uh, yeah, I would like it because it just is. It's paper trail plus it's history of the car. Anything you know? Do you got old pictures? Yep. Do you got an old story? Just jot it down on a piece of paper. I'll put it in the file and stuff, yeah, and it just yeah. carries on with the with the history of the car as it goes through, whether. You know, it stays with me or it goes to somebody You're else. You're the custodian for that time. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, the caretaker. That's yeah, all, exactly. yeah, you know, exactly. that's, that's Do you it. get as excited as my husband does when he said, oh, my God, come here, come, come look. He said, it's the original carpet under the spare tire <laughs> in the bottom <laughs> of the car, and it's got the original. He was so excited yeah. to find these original parts, right? And, and now you parts. get excited. I, I'm, I am getting there. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, Steve, just so you know, um, Beth has a steering wheel fetish. Yeah, oh, but it has okay. to be a I certain really steering wheel. <laughs> yes. I love beautiful, big, old steering wheels. Yeah, they look like sculptures to me. That's cool. I, I really do. Then you should start one in your living room. I think I could <laughs> do that. Really, a whole collection on the wall. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and they're not cheap to buy. No, they're not. They're not cheap to restore either. No. Exactly. So, but man, when they're done and got that chrome center cap or so, wing on it or uh, ring beautiful. or whatever, yeah. oh, he's talking dirty to Beth now, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not listening. I'm, <laughs> la la la. Yeah, la, la 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 la. So, so does that mean we can put up a steering wheel in the living room? Is that I what? Mean, I'm, we'll is that what a, I just we'll heard? Wall, you heard it here, folks. Yes, yes. I know. Oh, oh hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. PJ. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be the right steering. Moments. It's got to be the right steering wheel, though. That's true. Yeah. Too. It can't just yeah, it be can any be like old steering wheel. Some Some old Grant steering wheel or whatever. Probably a beautiful white Mercedes steering wheel from that would be pretty early '60s, something like that. Something like that. Would be beautiful in old '60s. <laughs> Bug steering wheel. How about like That's old Freightliner, some kind of <laughs> semi truck? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not the Gremlin in the. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, talked about. You know, it, uh, you mentioned something about history and talking to Steve. Is like, is that why you get into the like the collecting part? Do you you feel like you want to be a part of the history of that car? Is that kind of your what's the dr motivation behind it? Because I know there's a lot of people like you and like Helm that want to be a part of that legacy, but there's a reason why you do it. Is there any particular reason why you do that? You know, uh, it's just a combination of everything. It's kind of like sometimes it's the thrill of the kill. 
You know, it really is. You know, you, you it's like you find something and, you know, and I'll be the first to admit, there's sometimes I, I see something like, oh, my God, that thing is badass, you know. I got to have that and stuff. And um, and then you get it and, you know, it's cool. And then two weeks later, you forgot it's even in your shop, mm. you know, you're working mm. on other stuff. So then you start questioning it. So the, then what it does is it kind of hones you as far as your buy, your purchasing each time. It's like, well, am I going to be over it again in another two weeks? Is it really going to mean, mm. mean a bunch? Um, probably one of the um, – kind of got to backtrack a little bit here, but one of the questions we were talking about as far as, like, I'm the third owner of the car that Gabe had and so on and so forth. There's another car that I recently – purchased and i think that's the one that i might have told you about cj and that thing has got a really really cool story if we have time for it yeah, yeah, um, yeah. we're here but, about, here for the stories man okay so when i was a kid my dad was a drag racer too so not only did i go to shopping work but i also went to the races with them sometimes every weekend for months upon end sometimes it was spread out just depends and um so my dad would go always, we'd always pretty much go with a group of guys. And, you know, back when I was a kid, we'd go to Orange County Raceway a lot, which Orange County International Raceway, probably my favorite drag strip of all times. I mean, I got so many memories in my head from when I'm a little kid. Getting back to it, there was a guy in town. He was actually almost directly behind this shop, um, behind this complex here, and maybe up a little bit on Palma and his name was Dennis Thompson and um, we used to go with him coolest guy I mean just a cool guy big old guy big beard they called him fuzzy Burly. and um, <laughs> yeah but just cool He's, and he was a badass and um, so he had a red 66 SS 396 Chevelle that he purchased brand new and pretty much immediately turned it into a drag car. And so, of course, that car that was another part of the group that'd be going to the races. Well, he hauled it on the back of a car hauler. So it was like a, a wedge ramp car hauler. So in other words, you drive it up and the front end, it'd be higher than the back of the mm -hmm. truck. We've probably all saw those. Oh, yeah. And so, um, you know, when you're a kid and you walk up to one of those ramp trucks with a car way up on it and stuff, you're just like, you know, when you're this tall and you're thinking, man, I'm looking at a top fuel funny car. <laughs> you know, this is the this is the cream of the crop. You're like, my God, this is bitching, you know? And you're yeah. just like, so that car had always stuck in my head. And um, I always had a fondness for 66 Chevelles, consequently 66 Novas as well, just like the one that Gabe had for a minute. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, um, so... That car was sold by Dennis Thompson. I try to make this story short because I could go on all days talking about this crap. But that car got sold by Dennis Thompson to a guy here in town. His name was Scott Clausen, and he raced roundy round cars. And I kind of knew him through my dad. And then um, he also, um, I'm trying to think, he was friends with an engine builder here in town named Chris Gersovic, who I consequently worked for for a while. And so that's kind of how I knew the guy. Anyway, I knew the car. I went over there one time to his house. It was with my dad or somebody when I was real young. I remember the car being stuffed in his garage, and he was using it as a bench, like we all do with mm. cars when they get shoved in the corner. Mm -hmm. And I just rem and I remember that car, and I'm like, wow, that was Dennis's old car. And it's like, but then you know, time goes on. I was young then, and it just kind of disappears. Consequently, the guy that has really mentored me. A ton in car restoration and just knowledge and doing things right and stuff. There's a friend of mine named Frank Sines, and uh, he'd probably be pissed off that I even said his name <laughs> because he's humble. He doesn't want to be involved. Frank, we're going to have you on this show, by the way, so get <laughs> used yeah, to it. Yeah, we, we really are. Upset we can <laughs> well, well, yeah, we, we're going to really piss him off now. <laughs> You're so, dead, Frank. <laughs> but anyway, so fast forward all these times about, I think he said it's been about, 23 years ago, um, a guy that Frank knew, and, I'll, and that's a whole other story, I won't get into that, he came up and he was telling Frank, he was like, hey, you know, I um, I had it, this red 66 SS 396, 375 horse car when I was a kid, 
And I raced it and I did all this and we had fun and blah, blah, blah. And then the gas crunch came in the 70s and I put a different motor in it and I changed the gears in the rear end and I changed the transmission, blah, blah, blah. And then family and life came and I sold the car. But I kept the motor in the trans. So if you ever wow. find or know of a car that fits that description, I'm in. Wow. And so Frank is, he knows so many people and he's got his fingers out there and a lot of people call him and, you know, everybody respects the guy and likes him. And um, so he knew of the car that Dennis Thompson had. So he told this guy, hey, I know where there's one at. And consequently, it's only got 17,000 miles, Whoa. original miles on it because it was a drag car. And so Bingo. That's, that's it. So <laughs> this guy goes, I'm in. And um, consequently, um, he, Frank, and they put it all together. Him and Frank went out there. They purchased the car, and um, the guys the guy's name who purchased it was Jeff Pollen. And he came, he came, they came back, and he commissioned Frank to restore the car without doing a full restore on it because, of course, it was all original paint, original interior, original, original, with the exception of the motor wasn't in it, blah, blah, blah. So Jeff still had his motor and transmission out of his original car. Mm -hmm. So he had Frank... He had that motor freshened up and had Frank redo the car, still original paint. Frank wets in and buffed all the racing lettering and things of that nature off of the car and put the car all back together. Frank did the bottom of the car. The car's impeccable. Fast forward, um, the beginning of two years ago, Jeff started having some problems. He was a big drag racer on top of that. He started having some problems. They found out early last year after quite a few misdiagnoses. Don't quote me. I think that's what happened. They didn't diagnose him right for a while. When they finally figured it out, he had Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, no. And I think it was within, once again, don't quote me, I think it was within a month or two months, he passed away. Oh. And so Frank um, Frank and another friend of his, mutual friend of ours, um, went down to Jeff's uh, services. I didn't really know Jeff other than maybe meeting him once at Frank's shop. And um, so Frank and his other friend, Ron, went down to the services and I told Frank, I go, Hey, I don't want to be a bottom feeder here. That's not my, that's not who I am. I says, but somebody's going to buy that car. It's just the way it's going to work out. And if I don't speak up right now, mm -hmm. somebody's going to get it. And I'm going to wish I would have just spoke up. So he says, okay, I'll do what I can do. So anyway, we kind of let everything kind of cool down for a while and let his, um, his wife, Tracy, Really, really nice gal. Um, had her just uh, take a chill and, you know, try to mourn the loss of her husband and stuff. And then uh, they started talking. We put a deal together. And I ended up buying that 66 Chevelle along with Jeff's um, drag car as well. And, um, and that was it. But that, after this big long story, is the other car, which happens to be sitting next to the 66 Nova that Gabe had. So I have two red cars <laughs> that sit in that shop. So when I do come in the shop, so kind of the Nova is kind of the freshest purchased, but the 66 Chevelle is, you know, so those two cars, but that Chevelle, that's all the way back to my childhood. Like when I was single digits, yeah, that is the story you told me. That is okay. The, so yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. That's the one. But yeah, you're right. That's that amazing. it shows how this, how it comes full circle. That's one thing. Also it shows you how, small this community oh, yeah. is. Oh, yeah. How everybody kind of knows everybody or has a connection to somebody. And you, So if you need a part or if you're looking to find an old car that you sold that you hated, you know, you can uh, put the word out and maybe find that person. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, that's a great story. And it feels like almost everybody, every leg of the journey is just as invested at the time oh, as yeah. you are, ultimately, in getting that car. Yeah, no, it's... it's um Beautiful. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> It's it's the infectious disease that you get when you start getting into this stuff, and um, man, it's just the way it's just the way it is. I went this morning. I was out at a friend of mine's house. I was helping him. He consequently purchased a forty one Willys that I had, and um, so I went out there to work on it for him and do some stuff. And he, I have to laugh. And Gabe knows him. His name is Josh, <laughs> and um, we went through high school together. Long story short, is I was out there today and I was talking to him. And he goes, dude, he goes, man, he goes, so he's just kind of in the last, like, probably, I don't know, 
three or four years, really gotten into the cars. He had a car that I built for him 30 years ago, which he did the same thing. He sold it and then bought it back, and then <laughs> which he still has. And um, But he's gotten into some other cars, and he's ended up purchasing some cars for me recently as well. And when I was out there today where I'm going with the stories, he's all, dude, man. And Josh is really funny. He's a crack up. He's all, man, dude. He goes, I'm just whacked the fuck out right now, man. <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes, I'm serious. He goes, I, I goes, I just keep looking at cars, man. That's all. I'm just looking at cars. I'm just jonesing. He goes, if I won the lotto, I'd probably buy a thousand cars, man. <laughs> he goes, he goes, it's just insane. I'm constantly just looking at cars and go, oh, is that a deal? Is that a deal? You know, and man, he goes, and he gets, he's just all hyped up. But if you meant the guy, you would understand. Is he freaking himself out or something? He's just <laughs> like, he's like, man, he goes, I'm just having to really put the brakes on myself. Wow. He goes, because I find myself wanting to go, <laughs> want to go out and buy more cars. I see this car, this is nice. And he goes, and then I come to your place, of course, and he goes, and I see all these cars. And then I get a new kind of admiration for this level this year car and this yeah. style car and then i want that car and then which is he's like the crackhead time. talking about his crack problem at the crack house <laughs> <laughs> that's what he's doing exactly. and you're the crack lord yeah it's like, it's like you're talking to the wrong <laughs> guy about your problem buddy <laughs> my grandfather and i don't want to delve too deep into this but my grandfather always made parallels between cars and women and it's much better to be addicted to cars and looking at cars and buying cars and cars and cars and cars, and cars than the other way right so he was married <laughs> twice period but he'd always, he'd always bring that up. well and all the old photos of richard would always be yeah your grandmother posing yeah he'd always put her in front a of a car. car and he put her in front of an airplane or he put her in front of a car or a truck or a motorcycle but yeah <laughs> well it's like the the, the joke goes uh, and there's memes all over the internet now about like you know like this uh, a wife concerned about her husband behind behind the computer at, at midnight going is he looking at porn it's like nah he's looking at cars which is <laughs> way more expensive <laughs> <laughs> well and, and in this day and age like bat it's like, yeah, I mean, every, I mean, everybody's looking at Beth. Beth gets mad at me. We're sitting on the news set, and I'm looking at Bat, and she gives me this look like, <laughs> "Well, it's rude. <laughs> it's rude when somebody's giving the weather and they're telling you the weather's going to be the same as it was yesterday and a week before and five." <laughs> why is that rude? All the, That's why for the non-car people listening, it's bring a trailer, yeah, not Bat. You know, I don't know. So you look at it. You look at a, a bring a trailer, and you go, "Okay, I look for some cool car stories." But then the thing is, kind of like what you were talking about, is you look and you go, "Oh man, wouldn't it be cool to own this car?" Yeah, man, I would. Man, how much that's how it would starts. Drive trouble. Yeah, that's and then you keep driving them. You keep driving them, or you you buy them and you have them, and you drive them, and you park them away for a long time, and you go for the next one. I wish. Oh, I that's yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, come on, Steve, spit <laughs> it, spit it out, buddy. I wish I could drive them. Yeah, I just, I'm so busy working on everything. So what I've became is just a slave to the cars. That's oh. probably the only downfall um, with having so many cars and doing everything yourself. I don't generally farm my work out to anybody. Mm -hmm. So I try to do everything myself because I'm a control freak. And um, so therefore, at the end of the day, I'm so damn tired. Everybody's like, why don't you drive a different car home? And I'm like, because I don't want to clean it the next day because I got <laughs> yeah. too much work to do on other cars. Yeah. yeah. Steve, tell us, uh, Gabe was telling me, like, you do a lot of different things. You do body work. You do electronics. You do, like, tell tell us a little bit about all the different skill sets you've developed over having this great car place. Um, electronics, zero. Um, elect <laughs> electrical. No electronics. Electrical, yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I wish I knew more about electronics, but then I'd probably be in more trouble and spend more money. <laughs> you would. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, um, that just kind of comes with the territory when you're doing these cars, you know, you just kind of, and it becomes a little of both. Like when you're younger, obviously, you don't have carte blanche money to go out and just like, hey, I'm going to have you paint this car and you do, and I'm not, that, so you kind of learn how to do it. Well, then what happens is I've been fortunate enough to learn from the right people um, who have taught me how to do things right more than wrong, for sure. So when you do farm something out and you'll see, and it comes back and you're like, I paid for that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you not only pay for it, but you redo it. Right. So you basically paid them to have you redo their work. Yep. If that makes sense. Oh, yep. You yep. follow yeah. me on that. You so, see a lot. And so... There, that's why you end up doing more and more and more. And of course, you know, I can go back to my friend Frank. He's taught me a ton. And a lot of it is I, I did learn some stuff from my dad, but 
I've probably learned the most from my friend Frank. And then a lot of it is just self-taught. You just, and once you do something for long enough, and I, once again, I've been fortunate. Make enough mistakes. You, exactly. Yeah. You do. Mm-hmm. You, you're, you screw stuff up and scratch your head and just go, man. And nice. then you screw stuff up again on the same thing. And you go, man, maybe I just don't have it. Sometimes you question your ability right. to even do stuff. And, you know, you just got to stick with it and keep plugging. So, yeah. so like on a perfect day, if you walk into the shop and let's say you don't have a giant to-do list, right? I'm saying this is theoretical, I know. Okay. But in this in this perfect world, what would it be? Like what do you what's your favorite thing to do? Is it like, you know, body work or engine work or exhaust oh, work? You know, um it really it it totally depends on the mood and the mode you're in. Like I can come in some days and really be content doing mechanical work. And then other days I can come in. It just kind of, uh, you know, my one friend that I go to lunch with all the time, Frank, um, we talk about this. We exchange stories all the time. It's like there are certain things that could be the smallest thing, but you just dread doing it. You're just <laughs> like, man. And then you do it and you go, I was I procrastinated that for three months and I just got it done in about three hours. Yeah. You know, and mm-hmm. and instead I thought about it yeah. every day for three hours <laughs> while I was doing other stuff. You know, so you, you now I just I try to just if I can buckle down and do stuff. The problem with it is I'm getting torn a hundred different ways every day. So hmm. it answer your question. It just varies. So, so conversely, is there anything you dread? Like, oh God, I got to pull a tranny, or I've got to pull an engine, or you know, like what's the torture? It, it, you know, once again, that varies too because it's what car you're working on, how nasty, dirty, and greasy and grimy the car is. Um, you know, I've been working on my grandfather's cars for about a year solid, so I've kind of can went way off track from what I'm used to working on. So now I'm in an unknown area. I'm working on all these cars from the 30s and the 40s, and I know nothing about them. They're all mechanical. Everything turns. There's nuts, bolts, and that's the way it is. And what can come apart can go back together. But it's the the part I don't like about that is not knowing, like, I work on all the Chevy cars. I know where I can get everything, or I know a person I can call that knows. I can navigate my way around that. When I'm working on all these old cars on my grandfather's, I have no clue. I'm just I'm just going into it blind. I I, I understand the mechanics of it, but as far as like, okay, well, what am I going to do this car? This part's wasted. Where do I start? Well, what am I going to do with the? Where am I going to find a part for 36 Pierce Arrow? Have you, you know? come to West of Tulsa before? Have you seen the shelves and have you seen <laughs> all the parts that were back there? Yeah, it's, we probably have it. I bet we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just we're just comparing apples to apples on that one right there. <laughs> well, it's talking about one of your uh, grandfather's cars uh, is when I first met you, showed up at your lot, and first thing I noticed was two cars sitting right in the front that had the same shape to them. And you said, yeah, go ahead and take a look at them. You, you wanted me to do a little digging into the history of these cars. And so mm-hmm. I, I look, I see those two right near the entrance. So I thought, mm, it's a good place to start. Lift the cover off of them, and they're both Chrysler 300. Um, Her, Hurst. Hurst. Yeah, well, the, yeah, and there's one, it's a convertible, and it says Hemi on it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is a good place to start. There it is right there. Mm-hmm. So that car... We talk about the story and all the ingredients coming together. This car is just an amazing automobile, not just because of what it is, but because of the story. Let's talk about that a little bit, because that's one of our, my favorite cars that you have. Yeah. Um, it was your grandfather's, right? He he bought that at auction. Correct. Yeah. Um, the convertible Hemi car, it's cool, kind of a cool story. My grandpa would, you know, he would, how it would work out is he would just, I think he, I don't know, I don't really know. It's it really it's kind of a bummer. I didn't get to talk to him in depth about everything to kind of pick his brain, which, of course, you know, now it's all the woulda, coulda, shoulda. But um, I think what would happen is he'd get out there and start looking um, at cars and he'd go and he'd get it in his head. You know what? I, I, want, a, I want a, one of those cars. Or he'd go to an auction looking for one of those cars and then he'd see something else. And I was like, whoa. So he went to an auction, which you know the story, but he went to an auction, and um, 
he ended up purchasing that car along with a the Lincoln that he had that had I think it was a seventy seven or seventy seven Lincoln. Yep. Reggie Jackson, baseball player dude. Um, he brought him back to his um, shop in Huntington Beach for my grandpa. I think my grandpa bought him in Missouri or something like that. And um, so it was really cool. So when I went down there, I went down there with my grandpa to go get these cars. And I really, at that time, this was, I can't remember when that was, but at that time, you know, I was into the cars and stuff, but I didn't, um, I didn't, it didn't click. I knew Reggie Jackson had a good collection and stuff, but it didn't click, you know, what kind of cars and what, you know, what scale of cards that guy had. And I got down there and I just was like, whoa. You know, I <laughs> yeah, walked in that whoa. shop and it was like, this is all my cars here. Wow. I mean, he had Yanko Camaros. He had 62 bubble top 409 cars. Wow. I mean, the list just goes on and every car was like a high end, like low number car. And I'm just like, I was in heaven. I'm like, Grandpa, why don't you buy something like these <laughs> cars? <laughs> you know? And, yeah. um, so, but we, we, my grandmother took us down there to Reggie's shop and we, in Huntington Beach, and we drove both of those cars back Whoa. to Ventura. And I tried to get my grandpa, my grandpa, just let me drive the Chrysler because the Lincoln will be a lot nicer ride for you. And he's like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so that's how it went. So, um. By the way, that, that auction that you talked about where he bought both of those cars? Yeah. Was in Tulsa. Oh, it was in Oklahoma then? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I yeah. thought it was in Missouri. Oh, or something. Talk, talk about symmetry going yeah. on here. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was in Tulsa. It was 1995 in Tulsa. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So, yeah, so it was a little bit ago. So, yeah, when you called me to try, check out the history, uh, one of the, I went through all the files. And, by the way, he kept great files. Yeah, it was my grandma. Yeah, it was your grandmother. Yeah, grandma. She did a great job. So then I, I started finding paperwork from the auction. By, and the car was sold by a Dr. Guy Reed was the gentleman who sold both of these cars and a bunch of others. They had a whole, whole Guy Reed collection that was part of it that your grandfather bought it from. Again, 95 in Tulsa. And the question that a lot of people have about this car, because that was the, probably the last time this car was seen publicly. Because your grandfather bought it and then just kind of stowed it away, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, and so when you asked me to start doing some digging, going through the files, I worked backwards from when Guy Reed sold it because we obviously we knew that the only person who had it after that was your grandfather. Right. The question was who had it before? Right. And doing some digging, found out that this is what a lot of the Mopar guys called the one of none car. And mm-hmm. it, there's just such an interesting history be- behind this car because as soon as I started do- doing some digging on it, I found a Mopar blog, if you will, mm-hmm. where pe- there was a whole discussion. It had been gone on, going on for years whether this car even existed anymore. Right. And I called you up and I said, oh, you, you got you to see this. Yep. And... Um, yeah, I mean, for years. Oh, this. Oh, no, it doesn't belong. Oh, no, no, that car. That car doesn't exist. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, no, they they never built that thing. That's just a myth. And 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 I'm sitting there thinking to myself, no, I think that car really. I I was I just saw it today. <laughs> and so working backward from it, the way this the way the story goes, and I'll try to make this as quick as I can. So there was a, a Anthony Boccaccio in New Jersey who saw that they had built a Hearst Hemi. In 1970, and this would be the what they call the platform car. I think the Linda Vaughn car, um, the famous one where she's always standing on the back. Yeah, her, her yep. Linda Vaughn car. So that's he wanted that car. So he went to Chrysler and said, "Hey, can you build one more? I'll pay whatever you want for it." And they said, "No, we won't do it." So he ended up finding a dealer that would sell a, a, a New Yorker that he could have modified by a dealer, and so he found a dealer who he said, hey, again, I'll pay whatever it takes to get this thing modified. But it was very complicated because dropping a big old monster Hemi into one of these cars is not the easiest thing in the world. So he, he got the dealership to do it, and the dealership got some help from the folks at Hearst who helped with the original car to build this. So Boccaccio gets his, his 70 Hemi convertible, and then it sold to, it went from him to, let's have to look at my notes, a Steve McLeod in Tennessee. So this was Bristol, Tennessee now. So Steve, well, Steve McLeod at the time owned the original one-of-one Linda Vaughn car. So now he had both of the cars. 
And there was a there's there's a belief that there may have been a third seventy Hemi Hearst convertible that a Chrysler executive took out for a joyride and smashed it, destroyed the car. So, look. It, I tried to confirm the Boccaccio side of the story, whether that really is what happened in this case. I have not been able to get anybody to really call me back or confirm that that's the case. But looking at the documentation I've been able to find, that's pretty close to what it, what it happened. So then uh, McLeod decides he wants to change his collection around a little bit and wants to stick with just the, the Linda Vaughn, the real one of one 70 Hemi Hearst convertible. So he sells off that car to Guy Reed, Dr. Reed, who then sold it to your grandfather. <laughs> so then when I go back to the blog, I start running numbers. I start, you know, decoding bins and going through all the paperwork I've got. And I post on this blog, I said, hey, guys, I, I think I found this car you're talking about. And they're like, oh, here's another guy. Thinks he found the car. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, 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 sure. And one of the guys says, we'll post photos. So I I, I think I called you up and I said, hey, can I come down tomorrow and take some p photos of the car? Yeah. And so I went down there, took a bunch of photos, posted them on this blog. And sure enough, the, the next thing is, oh, yeah, those are good fakes. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I could see. I, I, that looks like it's real, but those are probably <laughs> fakes. Wow. So the, the, that can't be it. And so then I, they asked me a few more questions, and I, you know, I, I posted whatever they asked for. And then one morning I wake up. And some guy, and I, I don't know if it was Steve McLeod who had one, once owned it, because this guy comes on, and he's probably somebody who maybe even started this forum. But he goes, no, guys, guys, that's the car. Wow. That is the car. I know it's the car, because I still have the broadcast sheet for that car, and I got it mixed up in my files when I owned it with the Linda Vaughn car. But I can tell you from the photos, that is the correct one of none car that they had that they had That's been amazing. talking about for years. So you've got a very special car, whether it's just because of the amazing story behind it, right? Which it is, but right. also it's a beautiful car as well. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's just another piece of metal in the shop at this point. So you got <laughs> so you got to sell it and then buy it back three more times. Is that what you have? To That's do? negative with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and what does all of that backstory do to the value of the car? Well, you would hope that the person that would purchase it would be kind of like we all are and really be stoked because there's a there's some type of a trail of owners and so they can it, it just adds more provenance to the sure. to the to the right. car and and you know so because there's so many fakes of everything out there now i mean there's they always say there's there's more z28 camaros out there than chevrolet ever even built <laughs> and the same with super sport chevelles and all the ones that get faked and stuff but yeah you would just think that the whoever wanted to buy the thing that's gonna that's gonna add not only add the value but you know just you know keep it going on hopefully you know people stay into liking cars and stuff and mm -hmm. they don't start fading out and, well and, you know, and so. that's part of the debate with this car and that was the debate in in the forum was, is this a real car? Yeah. Is this real? Oh, yeah. I mean, because if Chrysler didn't make it, some people argued, well, then it's not a real 70 Hemi Hearst convertible. There's only one of those. Right. And that and, and this is a one of none. I mean, it's makes it rarer than rare. Some people think that makes it even better. Right. And then you add the story to it. Oh, and that's the cherry on top. Yeah. So I think that's we've talked about this before. What is the value of that car? And it it could be anything depending on who walks into the room and is ready to bid and what their feelings are about that car. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It depends where where it gets posted for sale. If it goes to auction, if it's a Friday night auction when everybody's tipping the beers back mm -hmm. and uh, it it runs away. Or you know, or yeah. just depending, it just, it's it's a total coin toss. What makes it car. unique to me is that the car sitting right next to it, the hardtop. The hardtop. Yeah. You got two cars, uh, and Danny, if you call it the the, the hardtop uh, pictures, it's it's identical. You know, it's oh, like wow. a brother sister car. You know, I prefer the hardtop. I'm a hardtop guy or whatever. But 
you know, you have these two cars sitting next to each other, which to me, if I'm a buyer, I'm like, well, buy how fake could it be? The guy's got an identical car, hardtop, sitting right next to it in the same condition, beautiful condition yeah. car. And this car, wow. to me, I like the interior on this wow. car is yeah. badass. It's just, wow. I mean, that don't get no more period correct than that, you know. But And that is a 440 into the hard, but yeah. Yeah. The four, yep. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would think it would be the opposite. I thought yeah, that the hard time would have yeah. a Hemi, but it's, it maybe, make, maybe makes the convertible even cooler that it's got a Hemi instead of just the 440. When well, the know. convertible originally came with a 440, they ripped that out and put in the 426 Hemi. Yeah. Yeah. It, but and we, you and I have talked about this that if you really want to, and we have to go do this at some point, get that thing up on a lift and find the, the oh, number no. stamped on that engine block to find yeah. out what year it is. Because according to the guys in that blog, if depending on what year that Hemi engine was made, that's where the value will skyrocket on that car, right? So we still have to do that, yeah. So I got to put you to work. <laughs> See, there you go. There's another thing you got to yeah, do in your. That's just one more thing to add to the list. <laughs> Steve, do you envision yourself one day owning two cars? Period. It's not going to probably happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. No. I mean, just depends if I, you know, my kid gets power of attorney and sells everything off when I can't move anymore. Mm. So, how many cars do you own? I, I have no clue. You really don't. I really don't know. Wow. I have no clue. I have a spreadsheet though that has <laughs> Steve's <laughs> cars on it. So I, they're not all the cars, but they're. Part of the collection that, um, well, everything's for sale, obviously, but, you know, a good portion of it, but I don't have it all. One of the cars you just bought was the Tornado. It was a 66 gold Tornado. Yep. Yeah, he, he sat that in that one. thing, and he was, like, ready to drive it. Yeah. That was a fun car to ride in as a kid. My grandparents would come visit in that yep. beautiful car. Yeah, it's, it's like def- a living room, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's crazy because there's no hump on the floor for right. transmission. Yeah. So it's just flat all the way across. And uh, when I was a kid... Um, Oh, was, I'll just call him a, a distant cousin had one of those, and I used to ride around on it once in a while. And so, and I don't even know what year it was. I just know it was a tornado of that area, same body style and everything. So, um, so it was kind of it was kind of cool. So it's like, man, I always kind of liked them, but obviously I like this one. One of the reasons I like this one is it's it's original paint. Mm-hmm. So that's the draw to me. Had the car been painted, I probably wouldn't have had as much of mm. an attraction to the car. Okay. Um, it's the fact that it's just original paint. Once again, it's one of those cars that nobody's touched. That's right. Beautiful it's, gold. And yeah. it really felt, it was kind of a formal ride in yeah. a way. No, yeah. no, they just, they floated down the yeah, road, you know? they mm-hmm. did. Yeah, they were like the big boat scenario, yeah. you know? I don't you, think my brothers punched each other in the backseat. They were <laughs> well behaved back there. They, they, they couldn't reach each other Steve is what makes it was. an interesting point. Uh, Maybe one of the reasons why he actually will buy a car is paint. I know paint's a big deal for. I know pa- for you, Helm, paint's a big deal. Because mm. if would you buy a car that you really like, but if you found out it had been repainted, would you still buy it? No. Why? I like the the original ass. Even if it has some like oh like like um, some blemishes ox- or some ox- yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, the original is definitely a kind of a deal breaker where you know that would I would I would love to buy that. Yeah, well, I, th- I think part of the problem is too that if somebody hears that it's been painted, they think, "Oh boy, it's been wrecked," and it's now hiding something. See, that's where I. That's, that's what or I. Or what else I mean. has been altered, right? Yeah, what yeah else exactly. Has been changed Absolutely. See, that's what gives me the green light because like, oh, it's been altered. Then I can just go and do whatever the hell I want to and have no guilt about it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. There's some guilt, yes. Yeah, I so I'm like, so I'm gonna tear the motor out. I'm gonna put some big fat tubs in the rear. Slam it to the ground and do something dumb and maybe even crash it. I don't even know. And but it gave the car butcher. Yes, yes, yes. Just don't engine killer. Yeah, don't, don't, don't <laughs> bring <laughs> anything nice to me. Butcher I'll those cars. It. Yes, exactly. You almost have less respect for the car then. Oh, no, no, no. I have respect for cars that deserve that kind of life. I would never do that to like a car like, like Steve owns or right. or Helm owns. Right. Which is the big problem I had with the '66 when I found out how good it was and what good. I was like, I don't want to cut this car up. Yeah. Because there's so few of them in that condition. Yeah. You know, but like, you know, Honda Civic, I'll chop that thing. And give me a saw. I'll cut it right now. I don't care. You know, but a car that, you know, there's like a bunch of them out there. And I know it won't, won't always be that way, right. but there's some cars like a, the Mercedes that I want that Helm's been looking for me for like years. He won't get, give me the ones that are for sale right now or that he can get a hold because they're too nice for me to do what I want to do to it. Exactly. You know, and so you wouldn't trust him with it, right? No, no I would. I would and he shouldn't. That. No, no, no. I, I would trust you on, on the mechanicals, what you want to do. But I, I think I know the threshold of like what type of, of car to start out with for you. Because to me, I would feel guilty giving you something that was a turnkey, beautiful, and then, you know. I, I'm, I don't know how I would classify myself. If you, you know, like you said, you want to put an AMG more in the Mercedes. 
I, I think I would gravitate to I, mean, I, I would accept that. Yeah, I don't know if I could put no LS in it. I mean, I could, but, but there's I a lot wouldn't. of people that do that. But I mean, it's it's that's where I think the grounds are where, where you meet different um, car people that you come to a common respect for each other and what how, where you guys stand, where we we all stand. You're and, a protector. Huh? Yeah, okay. yeah. And he's of the authentic. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and and I'll say my even my relationship with knowing Steve, getting to know more about the hot rods, which I never, I always liked the '66 Nova, and I just like Novas period, and the Impalas. Just growing up, I didn't know anything about them until I met Steve, and he, t he you know shows me a whole world of things because, you know, especially with the internet now, you get people with tons like, oh, you do LS swap it, twin turbos, yeah, that's all cool and fine and dandy, but something about like a big rat motor in a car, like, there's nothing like it. And when Steve showed, I was like. Oh damn! Like you can't get no LS to idle like a big rat rod, big block. It's nothing like it. There's nothing like it at all. I mean, don't get me wrong. A cammed out LS, awesome, but it's not the same as a big block rat motor, you know. And you learn that you learn that through relationships, you know. Like I've learned so much hanging out with you. I learned a lot about the Mercedes from Helm, you know. Just just knowing these people, and I just really dig that. I can and I can appreciate what I build. An all original '66 Chevelle or a, you know, '73 one two three wagon. No, unless I could do something dumb to it, like <laughs> what I want to do, sure, sure, right? Sure, sure. So I could appreciate that. You know, I just, you know, it's just one of those things that like I would do it, but I wouldn't do it to their car. <laughs> I'll do it to my car, you know. So we got to get pictures of some of your dumb projects because we got. If I ever, if I ever, <laughs> if I ever finish them, yes, that's what I want to see. <laughs> I remember real quickly. You're reminding me that my friend Vicky Shalato, her mother drove a Chevy Nova, and it was. I thought it was beautiful because it was yellow with a white top. Does that sound familiar? Do they? Yeah, yeah. And they it would do that. It was just so pretty because we, our cars in the family were kind of. I said kind of beigey, almondy, boring, and it was this beautiful yellow. What year was it? Well, you probably 70s. Okay. No, Nova, you say? It was a Nova. It was a okay. Chevy Nova. Okay. And I remember her grandma, mom was working. She was a nurse. And the grandmother came to pick me up. We were having a play date. And nobody used the seatbelts. <laughs> and I not. shared a story with the grandmother about my father had had a cancer on his eyelid and had to have surgery. Anyway, I was telling this horrible story. And she slammed on the brake. She was so, so shocked by my story. <laughs> and I remember flying down into the floor well, <laughs> the <of> the, <laughs> crawling my way back up. But anyway, it was such a pretty car. I just yeah. remember that. And it was a nice, smooth drive. And we'd all sit in the front bench seat. That's you have a history cool. of flying around inside <laughs> cars. <laughs> Beth. What is up? I'm a back. I, well, back I grew up without seatbelts. Remember that era? Oh. And she yeah. lived, survived. I did survive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a couple concussions, but you know. Oh boy, <laughs> we are all we all did, and we're all here still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Lucky well, I mean, speaking of that, um, uh, I we since you're down the street from us, Stephen, I know you've got a ton of stories to tell and a ton of cars. We definitely going to have you back on because you know I know we're just tip of the iceberg yeah. right now and you know talking about those uh chryslers which you know hopefully they'll they will go to a good home you know uh, once we get them out there to the market and ready for for people to enjoy them but you know there's so many other cars that you got and so many cool stories especially the rod i like the rotting stories obviously i think it's yeah. well established that i like to you know we'll do a hot rodder show we'll get in some hot some other hot rodders from oh, yeah. Ventura, Santa Barbara, and get everybody in here and let them fight it out. Yeah, well, 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 well eventually we're going to talk about the whole Ventura, history. Pomona thing. Pomona, the history. That's, that's right, a big yeah, deal there, right. too. So I'm sure Steve's got plenty of buddies down in Pomona that would love to argue their case for Pomona against Ventura. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man, that'll be a good... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll definitely have to have Steve back on and yeah, you know yeah. talk about more of that stuff, too. And, and also, Absolutely. too, about... you know We won't get into it too much today, but about how a lot of stuff is dying off. Things that, like, trades like uh, skill sets that the younger generations mm -hmm. they're not picking up you know the things that th they could be passed on like see the stuff that steve learned from frank or whoever he met along the way that he's using right now to this day why he can do things all by himself that are those skills are being lost and you know our uh, buddy uh kevin yeah um you know you know he's trying we'll to carry we'll that have, on. try and have him on too kevin yeah. haverly from well, even community hot rod project cutting car shop right in high school, that yeah. was a big, that's a big deal. Oh yeah, that's, that's yeah. that. I think I was like the beginning of the end right there, killing that's Auto right. Shop, yeah, you know, yeah. and stuff like that. You know, I agree on that one. And you know, it's funny. Uh, so a friend of mine out in Lake Havasu, who runs a big boat company out there, so he deals with a lot of super high end and big performance motors and stuff on these big huge boats. And um, so he called me the other day and he goes, "Hey, um, is it cool if I put a motor at your shop?" 
I said, yeah, what's going on? Where does it need to go or whatever? And uh, he goes, well, he goes, I donated. It came out of a boat. I wanted, obviously, a bigger motor. So I took the thing out. It's totally complete, and I'm donating it to Venture High to their auto shop program. And I says, oh. I go, they still got an auto shop? He's like, yeah. So it was a friend of mine's kid. Um, a friend of mine's kid is in the auto shop at high school, and that's who um, a friend of mine, AJ, from out there at Barrett Custom Marine, he's the one that donated the the engine and then they're going to take it and Tear take it, it all apart and yeah, check it all out awesome. right. in auto shop and it's a really bitchin motor because it's a big block and so and i guarantee nobody in that class none of those kids even know what a big block is sure you know i'm, I'm guarantee it so i mean this is like total cool factor and if they take it apart and then they yeah. put it back together and it's complete complete so that you can fire it up he put it on a crate i mean it's wow. got everything on it yeah. so they can take the whole thing apart put it back together put power to it it's yeah. fuel injected and stuff, but they'll just be able to put power to it and they'll be able to fire it up and hear it. It'll be loud. Uh, and yeah, so, awesome. would you go in and help them with that at all? Is that something that would interest you? I would go in and help as much as I could. You know, I, I think that's, I think it's way cool factor. As a matter of fact, my kid is going to private school right now. They don't have auto shop. And of course, he's just in elementary. He's got to go through junior high and blah, blah, blah to get to high school. But, even if he follows the trend at the school where he has their neighboring school, which is adjacent and kind of adjoined, they don't have anything like that. Yeah. So it really, you know, hearing that I started talking to my friend's kid and he says, yeah, they still have auto shop, uh, metal shop, wood shop, everything oh. at Ventura High. I did oh not know gosh. that. I thought wow. they kind of started deleting I thought they all killed I thought it all so too. too. So, right. And so he was telling me, so yeah, he goes, so I get, I go in metal shop. I'm in auto shop, but I go into metal shop. Sometimes I have to weld stuff up hmm. and bring it back. And I'm like, oh, even better. You know, yeah. that's, that's, well, that's bitching. Yeah. You know? yeah. Super cool. Well, I think we'll definitely have to do a whole thing on that because I think that's a huge thing, especially for the younger generations, yes. you know, and I think what's cool about it is that uh, a lot, of, especially in the, in the import scene, a lot of the guys are like, they're tired of like this hacking on the internet. They want to go back to like, what it was like before that because they're finding out how cool a big block chevy is or how cool uh, a certain car that back when you're drag racing you know a 13 second car is a fast car you know but now everybody's like well if you don't do sixes you're you're crap i'm like dude that's ridiculous you know no no human being can drive a six second car on the street unless you're maybe steve or something like that you know <laughs> but even that you're just like that's not re that's not reasonable you don't need a six second car to be cool it's like the instagram likes it's like if i get as many likes it's like it's not about that it's about enjoying something right you know yeah. and we talked about this in uh you know earlier shows you know about being visceral touching your hands putting yes. your hands to work and not being on an iPad or a computer right. or whatever, th those are all fine. But when you get your hands on something and it vibrates and it makes loud noises and it does something and, you know, you have the instant reward of, like, when you put something together and it runs, you're like, yeah. yeah. So Good I feeling. definitely think we should yeah. focus on something like that for the future get show. dirty you know? and smelly and, and greasy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the yeah. skills, the life <laughs> skills that you're learning. I yeah. think yeah. it's I think important. we should all vote for Beth to take a whole series of working on cars and getting dirty and grimy. Yeah. And, Changing a, a I, can can do change it a I can change a tire. Nice. That's the start. Now we're gonna get a start. start. We're gonna get Beth to build a big block Chevy with Steve. Oh. So that's what we're. Oh, there we go. There we go. Time. Yeah. Time. Okay. There we yeah. go. Love it. Take several parts. <laughs> yeah. All right, think, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, man. And you will come uh, back and join us again. Sure. Did you have so much fun today? You'll come oh, it's insane. I don't. I'm, I don't even want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's keep going then. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, I think. I, I think a good idea is the next time that Steve, you you come by for the next interview, is that you bring. I think you could. You have enough cars to bring to every episode you're on, if if you can. If we do it for at least another three or four years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be. We, we want. We want. We be on the air. I'm surprised you're not going to ask him to bring a wagon since you're all about the wagon. Oh, I know you have a, a hey, that, few hey, wags that are. There beautiful. you go, CJ. Let's just put a roll up door right here. Every we'll episode, we'll just in. pull a different car yeah. in here and, and have and have this around a car. Okay, Maybe. We actually thought about that. So whenever a guest shows up, we were, what we're going to do is watch you as you pull into pull the in, parking exactly. lot, <laughs> and then we're going to take that video and post it yeah. for your intro. Like, oh, oh he yeah. showed up in a beat up Volkswagen. Yeah, perfect. Well, I'm screwed. But, but, he's, but, my but he's got run, two hundred so. car collections. So. I have a quick question. What did you um, bring today? Oh, just my driver truck. That's it. Oh, nice. My daily hey, driver. You still, you can still appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. What kind of truck specifically? A Chevy, of course. Oh, Chevy. <laughs> nice. You won't find him in a Chevy. Ford that, that he owns. He doesn't oh, own a no. Ford. Yeah. My grandpa owns a Ford truck. Yeah. I still call it grandpa's truck, even though it's registered. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not yours. It's my not grandpa's. yours. <laughs> <laughs> I can't own a Ford. <laughs> uh, Steve, thank you again. We'll thank have you. you back with great stories. Yep. And thank you, everybody, for coming in thank and, you. and awesome. talking cars. So. Yeah.
All right, West of Tulsa, uh, like us, follow us, subscribe. We have a YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And don't forget, we also have a tip line up. So if you have a great story, if you know somebody who has a great story, go to our website, westoftulsa.com. Go to the tip line page, fill out the form, send it back into us, because we would maybe love to have you here in studio. You tell the story. All right? We're going to see you. Busted Tulsa. Thanks for watching.